In our last video on the history of African civilization, we covered the origins of the indigenous Berber people, known also as the Amazir. When we last left off, these intrepid native tribes of North Africa had just thrown off the shackles of the Arab Umayyad Caliphate. In this video, we will see the ancient Aborigines of North Africa build some of the most powerful realms in the Mediterranean world. Welcome to our video on the great Berber empires, the Zirids, Almoravids, and the Almohads. Shout out to Magellan TV for sponsoring this video and being our most loyal partner. We've been enjoying our Magellan TV subscription and hope that our viewers love it too. Magellan TV is a documentary streaming service run by filmmakers that has over 3,000 documentaries, among them hundreds of historical documentaries. If you want to learn more about Africa, Magellan TV has you covered. Leptis Magna, Rome in Africa, is a perfect intersection of Roman and African history. While Ancient Egypt, Life and Death in the Valley of the King is a fascinating in-depth documentary on the tombs of the pharaohs. You can watch both anytime, anywhere, on your television, laptop or mobile device, and it's compatible with most devices. Our viewers can now take advantage of an exclusive offer, 30% off an annual membership. This gives you an entire year for less than $3.50 a month. Every documentary we've watched has been worth double that, and there are now 3,000 in the Magellan TV collection. This offer is available for returning users too. Simply click on the link in the description to claim your discounted annual membership today. Support our channel and do that at try.magellantv.com slash kingsandgenerals. Start your free trial today. In 743 AD, various independent Amazir statelets in the western Maghreb enjoyed the freedom they had wrested from the Umayyads during the Great Berber Revolt, while the central and eastern Maghreb remained under the Caliphate. Just seven years later, the Umayyads collapsed and the Abbasids emerged out of the smoke and ash of rebellion as the highest authority in Islam. However, by the early 9th century, the authority of the Caliph was declining, and the Muslim world began fracturing. This ushered in a new wave of foreign rule over the Berber homeland, as Arab and Persian dynasties like the Rustamids, Aglubids, and Idrisids carved up North Africa for themselves. Despite this, a handful of tribal confederations on the fringes of the western Maghreb managed to survive as independent entities. Perhaps the most noteworthy of these were the free Berbers of Bagawetta, who due to their isolation never fully converted and practiced a unique mix of Islam, Judaism and Berber polytheism. Although the freedom won in the Great Berber Revolt seems to be waning, history is a fickle thing and North Africa would soon be back under the mastery of its native peoples. The tale of the Zirids begins in the 10th century, with the rise of the Fatimids, a Shia Muslim family claiming descent from the daughter of Muhammad, Fatima. At the turn of the 10th century, the Fatimids presided over the heart of Ifriqiya, where they took the form of an Arabic colonial elite ruling over a Berber majority. Many fierce Sanata Berber warriors fought loyally under the Fatimid banner in their expansion into the western Maghreb. Yet many other Amazir still harbored resentment at being under foreign rule, seeing no difference between the Fatimids and the oppressive Umayyads of old. In 943, a new revolt erupted, this time led by an enigmatic Amazir elder named Abu Yazid, who postured himself as an ascetic messiah leading his people to freedom similar to Biblical Moses. He led a remarkably successful rebellion that all but broke Fatimid power in the region, which forced the Caliph to call upon his loyal vassal Ziri ibn Manad of the Zirid clan, a warrior chieftain of Sanhaja Berber extraction. At the head of a fierce army of Amazir loyalists, Ziri was instrumental in crushing the revolt of his fellow Berber Abu Yazid. In 969, the Fatimids wrested Egypt out of the hands of the declining Ikshidids. Suddenly in control of the richest land in the Muslim world, the Shia Caliph al muizli din Allah moved his capital to the banks of the Nile, founding Cairo. The Fatimids quickly lost interest in governing the Maghreb and gave their North African territories to the son of Ziri ibn Manad, Bulugin ibn Ziri, who became the Emir of Afriqiya in 972. 
By all metrics, the Zirid realm was the first true Berber empire. While technically under the spiritual suzerainty of the Fatimid Caliph, their domain was entirely self-governing. Throughout their reign, they managed to establish control over much of the Maghreb, and even expanded their influence into the wealthy Iberian city of Granada, and over the Kalbid rulers of Islamic Sicily. Although all that territory was rarely controlled all at once, as the Zirids had to contend with tribal rebellions and interdynastic struggles. Despite this, Zirid rule ushered in a golden age of Berber culture, as their capital, Kairouan, became the jewel of the Maghreb, where higher education, art and architecture thrived, while agriculture practiced along the fertile Zirid coastline was among the most productive in the Mediterranean world. As time went on, relations between the Zirids and the Fatimids had begun deteriorating. In 1049, Emir al-Mu'iz ibn Badis decided to finally break ties with his overlord in Cairo. He converted from Shia to Sunni Islam, declaring the increasingly powerless Abbasids to be the rightful caliphs. The Fatimids responded by raising the warriors of Banu Hilal and the Banu Sulayn, two Arab tribes of nomadic Bedouin extraction, who defeated Zirid with ease. The cultural achievements of the Zirids were put to the torch, and the cultivated fields were transformed into grazing land for Bedouin sheep. Although the Zirids survived as a feeble rump state for another century, the Zirid age was over. It is here our story shifts to the hot deserts of southern Morocco. For centuries, the Western Sahara Desert was the forgotten backwater of the Islamic world. The tribes here were mostly Muslim, but being so far removed from Cairo and Baghdad, they often played fast and loose with Quranic law. All this would change with the rise of a Sanhaja Berber named Abdallah ibn Yasin. He had obtained a high education in the great city of Cordoba, and his time among the theologians of Al-Andalus had made him a zealot and a dreamer. Ibn Yasin wished to unite the disparate Berber tribes of the Sahara under Maliki Sunnism, which he saw as the truest form of the Muslim faith. In 1040, Ibn Yasin was invited by a chieftain of the Saharan Gadara tribe to be the religious shepherd of his people. He wielded his religious authority with an iron fist, punishing deviations with brutal floggings. Eventually, the Gadara became fed up with Ibn Yasin's fundamentalism and threw him out. Nevertheless, he was able to assert control over the Lamtuna tribe, gaining many followers, who became known as the al murabit meaning those who were ready for battle in a fortress, named for the Murabitan hill forts they held up in. It is from al murabit which the word al moravid is derived. In the early 1050s, the al moravids movement stormed out of the desert, forcing the Gudala, Masufa and Lamta tribes under their banner. In 1055, Sigil Massa had been taken, and by 1059, Ibn Yasin and his Puritan Amazir warriors were on the doorstep of the Bhagawata Confederacy, whose syncretic semi-Islamic faith was considered heresy of the highest order to the Puritan Almoravids. In their first clash, the Bhagawatas were victorious, and even managed to slay Ibn Yasin himself. Nevertheless, Ibn Yasin's brother, Abu Bakr ibn Umar, took up the Almoravid mantle and completely conquered the Bhagawatas, forcing them to embrace Maliki Sunni Islam. These conquests had transformed the Almoravids into an empire. In 1070, they founded a new capital, Marrakesh, which became a prosperous hub of grand mosques and colourful bazaars. Over the next few decades, they continued to expand on an exclusively vertical axis. For three centuries, the ancestors of the Almoravids had been traders, linking the wealth of sub-Saharan Africa to the Mediterranean world. Around 1076, they decided to take that wealth for themselves, establishing hegemony over the Ghana Empire, the exceedingly wealthy terminus of the Trans-Sahara trade network. In 1086, the reigning Almoravid leader, Yusuf ibn Tashfin, received a cry for aid from across the Strait of Gibraltar. At the time, the small Muslim states there were gradually losing to the encroaching Christian kingdoms of Leon and Castile, 
Yusuf decided to unite the squabbling Muslims of Iberia, and by 1090, nearly all of Al-Andalus had been conquered. While the Almoravids were largely unable to take back any significant amount of territory formerly ruled by Muslims, they were still crucial in preventing further Christian advancement into southern Spain. By the 1100s, the multi-ethnic Almoravid Empire stretched from Zaragoza in the north to Aldegost in the south. Yet this dominance would not last long, and the ensuing decade saw Almoravid power begin to wane, soon to be replaced by the final and greatest empire of the Amazir people, the Almohad Caliphate. In many ways, the Almohads were molded on the image of the Almoravids, starting out as a humble movement of religious Puritans, which grew into a massive empire. In 1106, a young Masmuda Berber, Amgar ibn Tamert, left his mountain village in southern Morocco to embark upon a decade-long journey to Mecca for holy pilgrimage. En route, he stopped in Baghdad, becoming the star pupil of the Iranian polymath Al-Ghazari, one of the greatest Islamic philosophers of all time. While Amar was there, Al-Ghazari received troubling news that the Almoravids had dismissed one of his greatest books as heresy and had it publicly burned. This enraged the theologian, who charged his favorite Berber pupil with returning to his homeland and correcting the misguided Almoravids. The youngster embraced his mission with religious zeal and preached furiously against the alleged corruption of the Almoravids of the sale of wine and pork in their cities, and their reliance on the corrupt court jurists to interpret religious law. Unsurprisingly, Ibn Tamert's rabble-rousing got him kicked out of both Fez and Marrakesh. Nevertheless, he managed to accumulate a core of devout followers who called themselves al muwaridin those who affirm the unity of God, or in English, Al-Mahad. In 1122, Tumert returned to the Atlas Mountains, founding a hill fort on the site of modern Tinmel. He proclaimed himself a Mahdi, Messiah, and declared holy war upon the Almoravid state. At first, the Almohads restrained themselves to small-scale raids on Almoravid lands, but in 1130, they grew confident enough to attempt to take the Almoravid capital of Marrakesh. This was a disaster and Almohad forces were handily crushed outside the city. To compound matters, Ibn Timurt died a few months later from undefined causes. However, before his death, Ibn Timurt had created an efficient hierarchy that would ensure an orderly succession. In 1133, a Zanata Berber named Abd al-Mumin was declared a holy caliph, the first non-Arab to ever take the title. Al-Mumin soon became one of the greatest conquerors in African history. Village by village, tribe by tribe, droves of Sanhaja Berbers who generations earlier had submitted to the Almoravids now switched allegiance to the Almohads. Soon, the balance of power had finally shifted enough to once more strike at Marrakesh. In 1147, the Almoravid capital fell securing the Almohads as the new dominant power of the Western Maghreb. And yet, powerful men with fundamentalist religious ambitions could never be content to rule a mere regional power, so further expansion was inevitable. Like their Almoravid predecessors, the Almohads soon looked north to Al-Andalus. While the declining Almoravids had been tied up fighting the upstart Almohads, the Christians in the north had made deep pushes into the peninsula. Zaragoza had been gone since 1121, and in 1147, Lisbon was lost to the nascent Kingdom of Portugal. Without a central Almoravid authority to guide them, the Muslim half of Spain had been reduced to a patchwork of disunified petty kingdoms once more. Caliph Mumin was quick to fix the mess he had inadvertently created and from 1146 onwards, began uniting the Muslims of Al-Andalus under the Almohad banner, all while keeping the Catholic kingdoms at bay. This would not be the only theatre of Almohad expansion. From their Moroccan heartland, the Caliph's armies stormed east. By 1151, 
they had conquered the central Maghreb from the Hamadids, who were a divergent branch of the long moribund Zirids. Since 1146, the Afrikian coast had been the domain of the Norman kings of Sicily. The Catholic knights were some of the deadliest units in the medieval world, but King William I was occupied with internal unrest in Italy, making it easy for the Caliph's mountain warriors to absorb their holdings into his domain by 1159. Tripoli soon followed, and by the end of Abd al-Mumin's reign in 1163, his realm stretched from Morocco's Atlantic coast to the core of Libya. The Almohads had superseded both the Zirids and Almoravids, and finally united the entire Berber homeland into a single empire. Both the Almoravids and Almohads were founded on harsh and simplistic interpretations of Islam, yet as both movements grew, they slowly drifted away from their puritanical outlooks and embraced the luxurious trappings of urban life. This is especially evident in the architecture they left behind. Notable structures that were either built or improved upon by the Almoravids include the Qubat al barudiyyin in Marrakesh, the great mosques of Tlemcen and Algiers, and the mosque of al karawiyyin which by virtue of its traditional status as a center of higher learning, doubles as the oldest university in the world. When the Almohads took over, they too would eventually add to the glamorous skyline of the cities of Al-Andalus and the Maghreb. The citadel of Kaspar in Marrakesh, and the great mosques of Tinmal, al qutbiya and Seville, as well as the massive minaret of Hassan, all serve as the legacy of Almohad architects. Both Almoravid and Almohad monuments merged native Amazir forms with the austere visual aesthetic of Al-Andalus, resulting in a remarkably distinctive brand of Islamic architecture. Beyond buildings, both textiles and manuscripts were an important form of artistic and religious expression, upon which beautiful calligraphy thrived, with both the Arabic and Berber languages written in a form of the Arabic script unique to the Maghreb. However, these empires were not a utopia. Under the Almoravids, the native Christians were often treated poorly, and at one point, even subject to mass expulsions from their homes after being accused of conspiring against the Almoravids with Alfonso I of Aragon. The Almohads were little better in this regard, and throughout their reign, Christians and Jews in both Iberia and North Africa were given the choice to convert to Islam or die. The Almohad policy of religious intolerance ended a golden age of high culture among the Jews of Al-Andalus, and likely also terminated the native Christian community of Afrikia, a remnant of the Latin population of the Roman era. These persecutions of non-Muslims were often detrimental to these empires' own practical interests. Expelling their religious minorities meant that the Almoravids and Almohads were depriving themselves of a consistent source of tax revenue. Many Christian communities in Al-Andalus had been faithful subjects of Muslim rulers for centuries, but the persecutions and expulsions committed by the Almohads and Almoravids made them flee to join the war efforts of the Catholic kingdoms. Potentially loyal citizens were made into bitter enemies for no reason other than fundamentalist dogma. Still, the Almoravids employed many Christian mercenaries in their armies, especially to fight the Almohads. The Almohads, for their part, were also capable of cooperating with their Abrahamic cousins when practical. Nevertheless, internal religious conflict often proved to be a persistent detriment to both Almoravid and Almohad prosperity. Unlike the Almoravids, who were dashed against the rocks by a tide of religious revolution, the Almohad's collapse would not be attributed to a single event, but rather a slow decline. For decades after the great conqueror Al-Mumin's death, the Almohads had remained strong in Iberia, even winning a decisive victory against King Alfonso VIII of Castile at the Battle of Alacos in 1195. But the tides began to turn, and in response, the charismatic Alfonso rallied a coalition of the kingdoms of Castile, Leon, Navarra, and Aragon, and crushed the Almohads at the Battle of Las Navas de Tolosa in 1212. 
in the ensuing decades, the Iberian frontier collapsed. By 1248, Valencia and Seville had been lost, even Cordoba, home to 600 years of rich dynastic Muslim tradition, had fallen into Christian hands. All that remained was Granada, which would hold out until its famous fall in 1492. The losses in Iberia created a domino effect across the whole Almohad realm, and soon the Maghreb began to collapse as well. Branches of the royal dynasty took advantage of the perceived weakness and carved out chunks of the Almohad realm for themselves. By the 1240s, North Africa had been divided between the Marinids, Zayanids and Hafsids. The last Almohad Caliph, ruling only a tiny sliver of land around Marrakesh, was assassinated in 1269, and with that, the age of the Berber empires was over. Although they would never again unite, various Amazir dynasties retained control over their homeland for around three centuries after the fall of the Almohads. It was only when the Ottomans swept into the Maghreb in the 16th century and the Arab Saudi Sultanate took control in Morocco that over seven centuries of indigenous Berber rule over North Africa was ended. The early modern era was a dark age for the Amazir people, as under Turkish and Arab overlordship, they were pushed out of positions of power and their culture and languages were marginalized. Under French colonial rule, the Amazir benefited from limited recognition as a distinct indigenous population, but when the modern nation-states of Algeria and Morocco gained their independence in the 1950s and 1960s, they embraced an exclusively Arab identity, once more pushing Amazir culture and language out of public view. Nevertheless, the Amazir identity is still present within millions of people to this day, and the fight for recognition in their traditional homeland remains ongoing. Decades of modern activism have made it evident that the Berber people will not go quietly into the night, and as long as they survive, the memory of their ancient African civilization and their great indigenous empires will live on. More videos on African history are on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see the next video in the series. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.